Good morning, church. Good to see you guys, and uh, man, what a, what a passage we have uh, to dive into together. Excited about our time in Psalm 32. In my uh, second semester in college, I experienced one of the more and embarrassing moments of my life, and that's saying something because I have a surplus of those moments in my life. Um, but because I was on the football team, uh, which had a pretty strict workout and practice schedule, uh, it sometimes made academic planning uh, difficult for me. And so that spring semester, I had registered for an introductory uh, sociology class that came into conflict with my morning workout schedule and our head, uh, our, our strength and conditioning coach let me know that I needed to change my schedule to fit. <laughs> and so I had to go back to my advisor a few weeks in and switch classes. And so I ended up dropping the sociology course and replaced it with an introductory a course on anthropology, the study of humans. I figured even though I'm a few weeks late, um, I'm human, right? This seems relevant. Seems like I have a head start on the content. Uh, The ancient Greeks stressed the need to know thyself, and so um, why not take a course on it? Know myself even better. So registered for it. I printed off uh, the new schedule, set out a few days later to attend my new class. But as I listened to the first lecture, when I got there, the, the content was far more foreign than I had anticipated. Uh, images on the screen, on the PowerPoint, were of various stars and constellations flashing across, and the professor spoke in some pretty technical language about the universe. Shortly in, I came to grips with the terrifying prospect, I might be in the wrong place. <laughs> and sure enough, I had stumbled into an upper-level astronomy course. I sat quietly, praying the professor would not call on me, and waiting for a moment when he turned his back that I could flee for the door (laughs) and get out of there. I soon found that LSU had two buildings that shared the same name with nearly identical room numbers, and I had picked the wrong one. So whose fault is that really? I mean, come on. (laughs) I get that that must have been a pretty pretty wealthy donor (laughs) when you got two buildings. I lived that day, though, what many people have only experienced in nightmares or maybe in uh, sitcoms or movies, right? You know the scene where the teacher enters the room and they walk up to the board and they write the name of the course and then fear sets in on the character's face as they see it? I wish that would have happened. That would have been easier for me. Uh, But they realize this isn't the class for me, right? This is not relevant to my schedule. This is not relevant information that I need for my life. It's not going to be on any exam I'm going to take, and they make plans to escape for the door. And so in order to ensure that doesn't happen with any of you today, I want to clarify who this passage is for and who this message is for and who may need to leave the room then, Um, and we'll, we'll turn our backs if you need to do that. But Psalm 32 is a sermon that is exclusively for sinners. If we were to give it a course name, maybe it would be How to Deal with One Sin 101, or an introductory course to to dealing with one sin. If you aren't a sinner, if you don't have rebellious or idolatrous tendencies, if you don't need forgiveness from God for anything you've done or said or thought, then none of this psalm is going to be particularly relevant to you. You won't feel how marvelous the news is that it proclaims to people like us. But if you are a sinner, this psalm is for you. It's a psalm for us to pour over, to treasure, to meditate on, to hide in our hearts, and to cling to every day. And it's encouraging to note that it has sustained generations of Christians before us. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the Christians in Rome, and he was establishing his argument that we are forgiven and justified, not by our works, but purely by God's grace. Paul quotes this psalm to make his argument. It was notably Augustine's favorite psalm. Augustine is said to have read it often, and that on his deathbed he had its words inscribed on the wall next to him. Not sure if someone wrote that or he picked it up from Home Goods or Hobby Lobby, right? But he had it there to meditate on in his last days. Athanasius likewise loved the psalm and wrote this of it. He said, when you see people being baptized and ransomed out of a generation that is perishing, and you are in wonder at the loving kindness of God toward the human race, then sing to them Psalm 32. Still today, it's a psalm for us to sing, should be music to our ears, and a psalm for us to cling to. 
because it shows we who are guilty sinners where to go and what to do and not to do with our sin and with our guilt if we are to find mercy and forgiveness from God. So we'll walk through this passage along four points as it develops, beginning first with David's main point in verses 1 through 2, that we would know the blessedness of forgiveness. So David starts, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So focus on that first word, blessed. It's such an important term in the Scriptures, but what is David talking about here? Is this a synonym for the word happy, and what we, we think about when we hear the word happy? Maybe if you can remember a few years ago when Pharrell Williams' song, Happy, came out, you know, clap along. Well, I'm not going to sing it, right? But maybe the jing, jingle just came into your, your mind when you heard it. Is that what he's talking about? Is that what's on the psalmist's mind? Is it a good feeling when life goes well? Maybe a, a hashtag to use when you're feeling particularly blessed, right? Hashtag blessed. Is it the feeling you have when the Sox or Patriots win? It's obviously much more than those things. But I think biblically we could summarize it as referring to the joyful condition of those who know God, of those who are right with God, and those who enjoy the spiritual satisfaction and flourishing that comes with that relationship, that knowledge of Him. It was the first word, if you'll remember, that we encountered in the book of Psalms. Psalm 1 begins with the word, bless. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the way of sinners, but who delights in the instruction of the Lord. Psalm 2 then said, blessed are all who don't take up arms against God, seeking to, to break the, the bonds of God's rule on them, but it's those who take refuge in the Lord and in His Son. Those are the ones who are blessed. And connected to those, Psalm 32 tells us, blessed are those whose sins are both forgiven by God and not counted against them by God. So let's unpack those images more. In these two verses, we have three pictures of the nature of our sin and then the fullness, the, the comprehensiveness of God's forgiveness. First, David says in verse 1 that our transgression is forgiven. Our transgression referring here to our open rebellion against God, our disobedience to His Word, the fact that we know what God has called us to do, and we have said, no thanks, in response, we're going to go our own way anyway. It says that type of transgression is remarkably forgiven by God. The verb translated forgiven in Hebrew would be the, the verb nasah. Translated more literally, we could say it, uh, to be lifted or to be carried away. When uh, I was a student and first memorizing Hebrew and Greek vocabulary, one of the ways that you memorize words when you're learning a language is it's always helpful when the word sounds like something that's memorable, right? And so NASA made me always think of NASA, right? This liftoff into space, carried away. Now, it's doubtful that David envisioned a spaceship <laughs> in the psalm, but I think you get the picture, right? This word is used in two important ways in the Old Testament. On one hand, it can refer to the way one bears their own sin, so that's how it's used in Genesis 4.13 for Cain when he kills his brother. It pops up again for lawbreakers at various times in Leviticus. They're the ones who bear their own sin, their own guilt, but can also refer to the bearing of another's guilt. It's used of the goat on the Day of Atonement that was sent into the wilderness bearing the people's guilt with it out of the camp. Most importantly, the verb is used to describe the work of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, verses 4 and verse 12. When it says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Then that in verse 12 says, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is what Jesus does for us, friends. That through his sacrifice on the cross, he takes our guilt upon himself. He bears it in full and then he carries it out of sight through his sacrifice. That's good news. But he continues the next thing David talks about is of our sin being covered. Still, the idea is putting our sin out of sight. It's not out in the open anymore. God's not staring at it. He's not focusing on it constantly, pointing at it. God has covered it. Right? He's, he's put it away. And so together then, these first two images are both 
uh, pointing to the removal of our guilt and transgression. As Psalm 103.12 later declares, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. That's good news, isn't it? (laughs) It's tremendous news for us to be reminded of today. But that's not all. Not only is our sin removed from us, verse 2 tells us it's not even recorded against us. The third thing David describes is that the blessed man is the one whose iniquity is not counted against him. Verse 2, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. It's courtroom terminology. And it points back to one of the most important passages in the entire Bible. Genesis 15, verse 6. Remember, that's where God makes his covenant promises to Abraham. He promised him that he'll have a son who will be his heir, which is a shocking promise, given his age. And from him will come a multitude more numerous than the stars. And we'd like to think that promises so rich, they would call for Abraham to step up to the stage and take the mic and offer an acceptance speech worthy of those promises. But that's not what Abraham does. His response is so much more simple than that. Verse 6 tells us simply, and he believed the Lord and God counted it to him as righteousness. He trusts God's word and God reckons, he credits that faith as righteousness to Abraham. He is justified then by his faith in God. That reckoning though, it goes in both directions. That God does reckon or impute righteousness to the one who has faith in him. And likewise, God doesn't count or impute our guilt against us. That's why Paul in Romans 4, he quotes both Genesis 15 and Psalm 32 together. Again, is that not great news for us to hear and to rest in today, friends? Is there any sin or guilt in your life that you really wish, wish wouldn't be counted against you? Is there any sin that you'd like off your record? One of the things that drives my kids the craziest when we play baseball in the yard is that uh, I'm, a, I'm a pretty just umpire with my two boys, right? They get up, three strikes, you're out. But when Lola comes to the plate, <laughs> right, when she steps up, they want me to enforce the same to have a rule against her, but I just say, I tell them, she can't strike out. And they say, what's the count? They always want to know, what's the count? How many balls? How many strikes? I'm like, we don't count against Lola. <laughs> Drives them crazy, right? But it's good news for us that if we're in Christ, the Lord's not keeping account on us anymore. He's not reckoning those things against us anymore. Psalm 130 verse 3 says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? If you start counting against us, who's going to stand in your presence? We're all condemned, and yet in Christ, our sin is not counted against us. Instead, his righteousness, his perfection is credited to us. And so this is the truth we're to understand from the very beginning, is that God, being the God that he is, he is in the business of forgiving rebels like us of our treason against him. And blessed is the person who goes to him to have their sin removed and replaced with righteousness. So David sets this truth before us, and hopefully the implications are already becoming clear for why he's doing it. One of those implications is that you and I don't need to hide our sin anymore. We don't need to to come here today and pretend that we've all got it together. We don't need to act like we're sinless. We don't need to project a version of ourselves that's far better than we really are. We don't need to try to fool ourselves or others especially not God, because for one, we'll never succeed. And the worst part, it's totally unnecessary. God forgives sin, which means we can acknowledge how bad we are before him honestly. I mentioned Augustine's deep love for Psalm 32, and one of the things he wrote about it is that the beginning of understanding, or at the beginning of knowledge, is acknowledging that you are a sinner. <laughs> it's where we start, to know ourselves as sinners And that's where the final line of verse 2 kicks in and connects us to the rest of the psalm. David says, the blessed person is one in whose spirit there is no deceit. So the first three lines are all about forgiveness, and then this fourth line comes along, and it kind of seems like if you were taking a multiple, uh, if you were taking a test, right, it was like, which one of these doesn't go with the others? This one seems to be off a little bit. It's on on a different note, but it's connected. 
right? Because when we have gone to the Lord for forgiveness, when we're honest about our sinfulness, there's no longer any deception left in us. We're not playing games anymore, trying to deceive God or others about our condition. They bring their sin out into the open, owning it and relying solely upon the gracious forgiveness of God. And that moves us into verses 3 through 5, where second, we should learn from David's experience. In these verses, David tells, tells us personally about his own experience. He describes his responses to his own sin. So he starts by telling us what life was like when he tried to conceal his sin, when he tried to cover it up. Verse 3, he says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. And so in the previous psalm, if you've got your Bible open, you can look in Psalm 31, verse 10. David spoke similarly about his sin. He described it as killing him from the inside out, soul and body included. He described it as as if his eye is wasting away from grief, his life spent with sorrow, his strength failing, his bones wasting away. Friends, can you resonate with what David's saying there? Do you know what he's talking about? Have you ever been so convicted, so sickened by the darkness in your own heart and life, so crushed by your guilt that you feel these words, you know what he's talking about? Maybe that's how some of us feel today. You come in wasting away because there's unconfessed sin. That's what sin does, though. Sin always promises life to us. That's the, that's the, the lure of sin. But sin is a murderer. It's a robber of life. Never gives what it promises. And David knows that feeling. He knows what it was like to have sin strip him of joy, to to take away the strength in his bones, and it leads to groaning and spiritual agony all day long. Brothers and sisters, do you recognize sin as that great of a threat to you today, as that lethal of a killer? Do we really believe that sin, if it's left unattended, if it's left unconfessed, if it's left concealed, will kill us. The great English poet John Donne once preached this psalm, and he likened sin to a venomous snake. He said, but beloved, sin is a serpent, and whoever covers sin does but keep it warm, that it may sting the more fiercely and disperse its venom and malignity the more effectually. So we're listening to a sermon from a few years ago by William Branch, who was a pastor, had formerly been a Christian rapper. He compared sin to a, not to a snake, but compared it to a mosquito. Very few of us, I would dare say, have been struck by a snake in our lives. If you have, you know, glad that you're still here, that you made it. But I think that most of us are well acquainted with the mosquito bite. <laughs> we know what that's like. And mosquito bites are annoying for sure. But they rarely produce what we would call agonizing pain, right? They're irritants. It's an irritating pinch, leaves a mark that's hardly noticeable. And yet, you could guess the answer to this, do you know what the deadliest animal in the world is? It's the mosquito. Kills an estimated one million people a year. And so, so much for Shark Week, right? We need a mosquito week. But the point is that we are not to conceal or coddle our sin or treat it as something that's not a big deal. David tells us it will wreck you from the inside out, make your bones waste away, take your life away. But in verse 4, that's not the only reason for David's misery when he had not confessed his sin. We're told sin was destroying his bones, but God's hand was also pressing down on him during this time. Verse 4, he says, For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up is by the heat of summer. So day and night, he feels this conviction, God's hands pressing down, pursuing him. And it was as if he was living under the summer sun with no relief. Last Sunday, I lamented that we did not have a thunderstorm happening during the sermon when we were talking about the Lord as uh, pictured through this mighty storm. And then now I'm like, we should have had this sermon last week. It was like 100 degrees outside. <laughs> we go, we go, preach the sermon outdoors, right? And feel a little bit of this heat that he's talking about. We can only imagine, though, what David's talking about to a certain level. Because in the 21st century and in our context, we think we know heat. But there's always relief to be found from it, right? We have AC units in our homes. 
in our vehicles. We have little portable AC units. You can get a fancy enough uh, mowing device that can keep you cool while you're out there cutting the grass as if it needs to be cut <laughs> when we have no rain. We have machines that make ice. You can grab yourself for relief in ice water or lemonade or an iced coffee. Maybe just saying them right now, you, you would long for one of those to cool off. But David's picture here is of suffering nonstop, like he's under the sun with no relief. It's beating down on him. His strength is gone. God's hand is relentless. As we think about that picture, it's very easy for us in the church to spend time celebrating God's helping hand of deliverance. But we don't like to think as much or celebrate as much God's heavy hand of discipline on us. But we need to recognize that God's heavy hand is still a hand that is full of mercy and kindness to us. It is there to lead us to repentance, and that is an act of grace by God. It's not pleasant when that hand falls upon us and it disturbs our conscience, wrecks our sleep, messes with our life. But there's something in the Bible that we see is worse than when God's heavy hand is upon us. And that's when God's hand is removed. And that's what Paul describes in Romans 1. When he speaks of how God has given the unrighteous over to their sin. Right? They, they traded the glory of the Creator for His creation and God has given them over to chase after these things. That is a terrifying thought of God taking His hand off and allowing us to chase after idols in the desires of our own wicked hearts unto our own destruction. And so when we chase after those things, when we convince ourselves we'll find joy in life outside of God, who will be the one to call us back to pursue us, if not the Lord? And so if you feel God's heavy hand upon you, chasing you down, grabbing you, convicting you, exposing your sin, recognize it for what it is. It is His kindness to you to lead you to repentance. And that's where David goes next. He tells us next of his experience when he confessed sin in verse 5. He said, Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Love this. Because note the, the paradox of confession. When David chooses to make his sin known, and he says that he's not going to cover it, the same word is used as in verse 1 for what God does with his sin. So we get the picture that if David tries to cover his sin, God's going to expose it. But when David chooses to uncover it, to confess it in the open, God graciously forgives his sin and God himself covers it. And so the paradox of confession and repentance is that the only way for our sin to be covered is to uncover it, is to confess it. And then next, note the comprehensive scope of the confession. Every word for David's rebellion that popped up in verses 1 through 2, transgression, iniquity, sin, they're used again in verse 5. And so the portrait is that just as David's sin was total, so is his confession. Nothing is concealed or held back. No deceit remains. And so what's the result when David does this? When God hears this, does God respond with shock and awe like, dude, <laughs> you are messed up. I didn't know you were that dark. No, it'd be ridiculous, right? God already knows this all. He forgives David, though, he meets him with grace. And so what a relief to go to him because it's a miserable life to try to hang on to our sin constantly, always afraid of being found out. It's a marvelous thing, though, when we bring it out and God meets us there with forgiveness. One commentary said, Confession is like opening the floodgate of a dam. When there is no confession, the waters pile up behind the dam, creating immense pressures on the wall. But as soon as the floodgate is opened, the waters subside and the pressures diminish. John Dunn mentioned him a minute ago, offered a much more graphic illustration, but maybe a more memorable one. He said, it, it's but a homely metaphor, but it's a wholesome and useful one. Confession works like vomiting. It shakes the frame, and it breaks the bed of sin, and it is an ease to the spiritual stomach, to the conscience, to be disburdened in this way. I've had some stomach bugs that resulted in some like marathon sessions 
with what he's talking about here. And I can amen that quote heartily. If you've been through that and the relief that's found from that discomfort, maybe that's not the picture you wanted um, when you came in on Sunday morning. Like, man, I hope there's a vomit illustration mixed in. If you came looking for it, you're welcome. But it's a helpful picture, right? Like anyone that's experienced the misery of like severe nausea that often comes before throwing up, they know that many times you're, you're oddly, you're longing to get it over with. Relief comes on the other side, and so it is with confession. Confession is not always a pleasant or happy experience when we're on our knees, sick, having to vomit out the darkness of some of our thoughts and words and deeds, but sweet relief and forgiveness is available in Jesus when we do it. And so, brothers and sisters, what about your life today? Is there sin that remains unconfessed? What needs to be brought out of the darkness and into the light before the Lord and confessed to Him? Because as we see here, hiding it is a game that we will never win. He already sees it. He already knows it. In fact, He knew about it before we did. (laughs) And so, will we stubbornly deny it still? Plead our innocence? Or will we go to Him for mercy, acknowledging our guilt? So David moves from his his experience of God's forgiveness to the obvious lesson we should learn, leading us to the third point, that we would listen to David's instruction. Verses 6 and following, David says, Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. Therefore, he concludes, since your sin is so deadly and your God is so gracious, what are you waiting for? Run to the Lord in prayer. Run to Him in repentance while the opportunity remains. It's urgent. You shouldn't walk around with your sin any more than we should walk around with a ticking bomb in our hands. When David says that the rush of great waters won't reach him, I think it's pointing back to Psalm 29. We saw the imagery of the waters that pointed to the flood of Noah's day last week. And in that story, in the story of the flood, there was an opportunity to repent to enter the ark up until the point that the Lord closes the door and seals them in. And for us, until the day of the Lord comes, prayers can still be offered to God. Sin confessed. Forgiveness and salvation can be experienced. But when the day comes, the opportunity ceases. And so the call is urgent. Don't delay. Don't bank on tomorrow. The day will come like a thief in the night. As Psalm 95 says, today, if you hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts. Instead, turn to him if you hear his voice. If you feel the heavy hand of God pressing in, repent and turn to him today. When we do, David says in verse 6, that floodwaters won't reach us. The reason is in verse 7. He says to the Lord, because you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. The godly find in the Lord a shelter from the storm. He preserves them and he ensures that they will hear words of celebration around them rather than words of condemnation. Then in verses 8 through 9, David continues to instruct and reflect on his own stubbornness initially to repent and obey. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle or it will not stay near you. It's like a vivid illustration here. David talks about these animals that you're not just going to be able to sit down and and, and reason with, right? Make an argument like, hey, this is the better way. Like, just trust me on this one, (laughs) right? They're they're coerced to obey with the bit and the bridle. And he's saying, don't be like these animals that have to be led by force or by fear. David is calling us to be those who trust and obey the Lord at all times, not merely when the heavy hand of discipline comes our way. At those times, we should repent, but for the believer, it shouldn't take getting caught to feel the need of confession. It shouldn't always take the whip or the bit or the bridle, though sometimes God knows that's exactly what we need. Rather than purely the fear of judgment, we run to Jesus because we have learned from his word and from the spirit that he alone brings joy and that repentance is the way to go. That leads us then to our final point of the psalm, that we would respond appropriately to God in light of who he is. Verse 10, David drives home this message. It says, Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. 
point is both the unrepentant and the repentant, the wicked and the righteous, will be surrounded by something. David knows each outcome well. The unrepentant will be swallowed up in sorrows. Many griefs await them as they chase after idols, as they indulge their sin and live with the consequences both immediately and eternally. But the repentant, those who trust the Lord, they will be surrounded by God's steadfast love. Think about that idea of being surrounded by something. If you've ever like been to a location where it's just beautiful view in every direction, right? You're just standing there and everywhere you look, uh, whether it's mountains or you're looking uh, over the sea in one direction with a beautiful background behind you, to be surrounded by beauty. But what, what would you want to be surrounded by more than this, right? To be surrounded by God's covenant, steadfast love, swallowed up in it. And so in response to that, let me draw out four points of application for us today from this word. And the first would be, very simply, to hear the invitation to come and have your sins forgiven. Everyone in this room, everyone that we know, everyone listening with us is a sinner by nature and by choice. We are born rebels against our Creator and King. And whether we own up to that or not, it doesn't really matter. It's true. It's what God has has told us. And in 1 John, the author, John discusses several responses we can have to that reality. The first response is one of the liar and the deceiver. 1 John 1, 8, he says, if we say we have no sin, I don't have any sin. He says, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And so don't respond like the deceiver. Don't lie to yourself or to others. But the appropriate response, verse 9, is that of the confessor. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How in the world can God do that? How can God look at our sin if he's faithful and just, right? If he's a just God, how can he look at it and forgive us? Because we've done some wicked things. John tells us in the next chapter, 1 John 2, 1 through 2, he says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In Jesus' death, we have atonement for our sins. He's the propitiation that we need. And in Jesus' resurrection life, friends, today, as we meet, we have an advocate with the Father. Though all we bring to the table is our sin and unrighteousness, Jesus, the righteous one, testifies on our behalf. His death paid for our sin. His righteousness then is accounted to us by grace. And so don't try to cover it. Come to Jesus, and he will cover it for you and remove it from sight forever. Second response. Rejoice, you who are forgiven. This is what David commands of God's people in the closing verse, verse 11. He says, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. This is the necessary response to the forgiveness we've received, singing and rejoicing and shouting, wholehearted, whole life worship. We do that for earthly things, right? Great human performances. One of the ones I always love is when people like clap at the end of a, of a good movie in the theaters, like the cast and the <laughs> director are there. <laughs> it's like they appreciate the applause. Uh, we, we clap for sports victories, right? Our team wins. They just rock us applause. We clap when our pilot lands the plane safely after uh, some turbulence. That's something to be thankful for. But this right here is worthy of our most enthusiastic celebration of all. We have been forgiven, made righteous, declared righteous by God's grace. The only way we won't respond appropriately to the forgiveness we've been given is when we've forgotten the magnitude of our sin and the greatness of God's grace. Because when we truly know ourselves to be who we are in our sin, we know how twisted and guilty we are. And when we truly know how holy and just and righteous God is, it should stun us every day that not only Has God chosen not to cast us into the fire? He has actually chosen to adopt us into his family. 
through the death of his son. And so rejoice, sing, celebrate in a way that corresponds to the greatness of the forgiveness we've experienced. Third response, forgive. Be forgiving, you who are forgiven. This theme pops up so much in the scriptures, there's no way we'll do it justice right now in a, in a minute or two. But it's, it's everywhere that those who have been forgiven the most must be the most forgiving. Jesus says it in Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Then next chapter, he tells us to pray these words in Matthew 6, 12, And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Paul picks up on the theme in Colossians 3, 12 through 13, when he says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. And that key line at the end. So I don't want to do that. <laughs> it's tough. People have really hurt me. He says, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. That's the standard. One of the most essential marks of Christ's people, then, is radical forgiveness to others. Forgiveness that doesn't make sense to the world around us. A forgiveness that's born out of our own experience of a greater mercy for worse sins against a, an infinitely greater being, God. But we can't have it both ways. We can't refuse mercy and forgiveness to others while expecting divine mercy for our sins. And so that's third. Be forgiving. And then fourth and finally, that we would go and we would proclaim forgiveness. Like David, we speak to others as those who have personally experienced the foolishness of trying to cover our sin and hide it and project an image that isn't accurate. But we also know the joy found in repenting and finding life and forgiveness in Jesus. And so the question for us as we go from this place today is going to be, who would God have you tell the good news of this passage to this week? Who would God have you share your story of how you once wasted away because you were bearing the guilt of sin and the relief that you found when you brought those sins to the Lord and found redemption and forgiveness in Jesus? Who can you tell that story to? Finding steadfast love in Christ alone. May God make us faithful to live that and proclaim it this week. Would you pray with me as we prepare to respond in song? Father, you are so great and so gracious to us. And Father, even as we meditate on these words, it's so difficult for us to, to really wrap our hearts and minds around the magnitude of what it is that we're celebrating, to wrap our minds around just how deep our sin goes, just how offensive and wicked and dark it is, and just how great your grace and mercy is to us. But Father, we pray that you would impress that upon us today, that, that one, we would take sin seriously, that if there are those among us who are trying to do the very thing that David said not to do, and they're trying to hide their sin and cover it, to pretend they're okay, maybe to, to even give a version of their sin that's not so sinful, makes it sound better than it really is. Father, pray that you would break us of that today, that you would lead us to confession, even though that can be a painful experience, that we would truly trust that, that joy and forgiveness are found only in you and by bringing this to you. And Father, pray for those who have been forgiven much by you, that you would form us into the image of your Son more and more, that as those who have been forgiven by him, we would be the most forgiving people, the kindest people to others, the most patient with them, the most humble people, because we recognize the grace that you've shown us in our lowly estate. So Father, lead us now as we sing in response to your word. Prepare us as, as we ready ourselves to go into the world, living out these truths and proclaiming them to others. We ask this all for your glory in Christ's name. Amen.